Well, good afternoon, everyone. Thank you so much for joining us today for our National D-Day Memorial Lunchbox Lecture Series. And we're delighted today to have with us author Alexis Clark. Uh, we are joining you, of course, remotely from our uh, respective locations because we're also dealing with a lot of winter weather like most of the country today. So uh, we are very pleased to still be able to do this lecture today. And I am just so happy to have Alexis with you. I'm going to be introducing you and telling you more about Alexis in just a moment. Uh, but let me just mention a few uh, quick items because uh, we're so delighted um, to be able to bring these lectures to you virtually, uh, to be able to share with you these wonderful stories uh, that I know uh, you will enjoy. And we encourage you at the end of today's um, uh, lecture to please, please submit some questions that you have. You will see uh, a place um, to uh, enter those comments at the end of the lecture. And we encourage you to do so um, because I think you will really enjoy today's lecture and have some um, questions or comments that you would like to share. Keep in mind that uh, Thursday, March the 4th is our next Lunchbox lecture. and We're going to have curator Tracy Bradford joining us and she is with the U.S. Army Women's Museum in Fort Lee, Virginia. She's going to actually take us around uh, and give us a detailed look at how the museum collects and interpret, uh, interprets Army women's history. And she's going to be sharing a couple of stories with us. And I encourage you to join us for that on March the 4th. We're also going to be doing a, a book club discussion on March the 9th. Um, this is All the Light We Cannot See. And uh, Anthony uh, Dorr, we, uh, this book came out a couple of years ago. It's absolutely fabulous. And we hope that if you have read it or if you have not, uh, please join us for a wonderful discussion on the book. It's um, quite well done. So we look forward to having that as well. And for any of the listing of our lectures upcoming, please check our Facebook page, our website, dday.org, and you can uh, see um, the list of many of our upcoming lectures that we have. But today I'm just so thrilled to have Alexis Clark with us. Uh, she has written uh, a wonderful book and I know she spent a great deal of time uh, researching and it's called Enemies in Love, a German POW, a Black Nurse and an Unlikely Romance. Um, Alexis is an author and freelance journalist. She writes about history with a focus on race, culture, and politics during World War II and the civil rights era. She is a contributing writer for the History Channel with stories on African-American culture, the military, and milestones in social and racial justice. She also writes historical features for the New York Times and helped launch its digital section, Past Tense. She's received grants from the Ford Foundation for her World War II research projects. Uh, she started her journalism career in 2002, is a former senior editor at Town & Country Magazine, where she covered political and philanthropic events across the country. She's a Dallas native, a graduate of Columbia you know, Journalism School, where she is uh, currently an adjunct professor. She also holds an MA in government from the University of Virginia, right down the road from us, and a BA in political science from Spelman College. Her book that we're going to be discussing today was published by the New York Press in May of 2018. It has since been covered by the New Yorker, the New York Times, PBS NewsHour, Weekend, mm -hmm. NPR, uh, the Philadelphia Inquirer, and, and many others. And um, I, I have to tell you that as soon as I read the book, I could not put it down. I read it in one setting because it was just so wonderful. And you really get caught up in the story. And Alexis, you put a great deal of research into this. And I knew we wanted to share this with our listeners. So uh, welcome. And uh, let's just dive right into this beautiful story. Great. Well, thank you so much for having me. And thank you to everyone um, in attendance. I'm honored to be here. So I figured I'd start off with the question that I get asked the most is, um, how did you find the story? I mean, you've got an African-American nurse, um, a German prisoner of war, and they meet and fall in love in Arizona in World War II. So you're like, okay, how did, how, how, I need to unpack this. So really this book started, um, it was, I was having a basically dinner with my mom, a casual conversation, and she shared with me that we were distant relatives of a man named Colonel Charles Young, and I actually have a photo of him I want to share, he was the highest ranking African-American in the military until his death in 1922. So let me get to our photos if you bear with me. This gentleman right here, uh, Charles Young. Uh, okay, we can go back now to the regular, just me. <laughs> and so 
anyway, I just started researching and reading everything on African Americans in the military. Um, I was fascinated because when you really think about, particularly in that era, they were fighting for rights um, that weren't yet afforded to them. So I happened to stumble across a book called G.I. Nightingales. And this was all about World War II nurses. And uh, there was this one chapter on uh, black nurses who served. And uh, there's a sentence in particular, and it just changed everything I thought I knew about World War II, and I'll read it for you. It says, the war had fond memories for Eleanor Powell, who met and later married a German prisoner of war at a camp in Arizona. Like, what? So I contacted, I emailed the author and um, a woman by the name of Barbara Brooks Tomlin, and she is a Naval scholar. And I asked her, I'm like, well, this woman who said she married a German POW, is she alive, tell me about her. And she said, well, I actually never met her. I just sent out a questionnaire um, for my research and she did this back in the 1990s. Um, and this woman happened to include this really interesting factoid about herself. And so I just, I couldn't let it go. Um, I had so many questions and I wanted to understand uh, how black nurses and German POWs came to be in the same vicinity, how German POWs were even in the United States because I did not know that. Um, so then that just really, that's what started the research and what led me to then I had something for an article and then I had something for a book. So I turned into a graduate student again. And what I first learned was that uh, the United States captured approximately 400,000 German POWs um, in Northern Africa and Europe. And they shipped them, they put them in large vessels, transatlantic voyages to the United States to work in POW camps. Um, and this started in 1942. And actually the breakdown, I have it, it was 371,683 German POWs. 51,156 Italian POWs, and 5,412 Japanese POWs. Um, and I actually have a, a photo of them as well. And so what would happen is once they got to the United States, then they would be transported um, by train and they would have these PW uniforms on the back of their shirts and their pants. Okay, that, that's it for that one. We can go back. And so all of this was legal under uh, the Geneva Convention of 1929. Captured soldiers uh, could be detained in camps and they could be forced to work the enlisted men as long as there were certain humane standards that were maintained. And at the time, Britain desperately needed help with all the POWs. They had their own population of captured soldiers at the same time. Um, Europe was being bombed to death, so they needed some relief. Um, and so they specifically asked the U United States, you need to take some of these POWs. And at first it was, it was resistant. They just weren't sure how deeply involved they wanted and if they wanted to have Germans actually in the United States, POWs. I even found a quote from um, J. Edgar Hoover at the time, and he said of the typical Wehrmacht soldier, he said, Trained as he is in the technique of destruction, he is a danger to our internal security, our war production, and the lives and safety of our citizens. So there's a lot of fear of what would happen, but uh, it happened nonetheless. So the United States decided that they would start um, accepting prisoners of war, and eventually it's about 600 camps across the United States, and it made sense because what else was going on is that there was a lot of unskilled labor uh, needs because so many American men were off fighting the war or basic training, defense plans. So the German prisoners became the workforce. They worked on farms, laundromats, canneries, and essentially the labor needs were specific to the region. So for example, in the Appalachian areas, um, Northern Minnesota and Michigan, Thousands of POWs were used for logging and lumbering. Um, in Arkansas, they picked grapes. In New York State, um, Northern Illinois, they worked in canning plants for the food services industry. But in Arizona, 
which is where my nurse and the GP, G, uh, POW met, uh, the biggest need was cotton picking. So cotton picking had been the hardest work, usually reserved for the poorest people. And we know that obviously with the, also the history of slavery, but the cotton farmers needed cotton pickers. And cotton was a crop that was managed um, not by high-tech agricultural machinery yet. So it was still a lot of manual labor needed, that back-breaking work, you're extracting the cotton from the thorny bush. And it was vital, cotton was vital to the war effort um, and central to Arizona's economy. So there were several tire companies that moved to Arizona, most notably Goodyear, um, which set up several factories. Even by, by 1920, there was approximately 800,000 acres of cotton in Arizona. So it was needed for military uniforms, linens, tires, airplane wing covers. It was, uh, it was essential material. And the POWs then became some of that labor force. So once I started, fine, okay, I understand. So that we brought the POWs to the United States to work. I still needed to understand how that interaction between POWs and nurses came to be, particularly if you think about the tenets of, of, of Nazi ideology. It seems like this would be a recipe for disaster and, and quite volatile. So that made me think, okay, who is, who is Eleanor Powell? Who is this nurse that not only interacted with POWs, but she ended up falling in love with someone. So I needed to track down everything I knew about Eleanor Powell. And so let me just first show you, so we know we're talking about our, our photo of Eleanor. So this is, this is Eleanor Powell, okay? And so Eleanor, um, Unfortunately, she was deceased by the time I discovered this story. So I had to look at documents, uh, find out relatives, who's alive, was her husband alive, Frederick? No, unfortunately, he was deceased as well. But what I did find is that they had two children, two sons, and I found an address. So I ended up writing a letter to that address. I'm a journalist. I'm intrigued. I'd love to talk, blah, blah, blah. And one of the sons emailed me back. Uh, his name is Chris Albert. Uh, he's a retired jazz musician. So what started were a series of interviews, um, just asking him everything about his parents. And I was so fascinated in particular with Eleanor. So she was from Milton, Massachusetts, which is a progressive uh, suburb of um, Boston. And she grew up in her uh, father's childhood home. And this is quite interesting. So let me go back to the photo to show you um, where she grew up. Okay. So if you can see this, is that, yeah. So this is a very beautiful stately colonial home and quite substantial and, um, quite unusual for that time and particularly African-American, um, at that time too, when life was so difficult. So we can take out of that photo if you like. So it turned out I did some digging on her background. Her grandparents were escaped slaves um, and they made their way to Milton and they ended up working for a man named Samuel Littlefield. And he made a small fortune in making carriages and real estate and he didn't have children. So with the real estate records at some point, it became the Littlefield Powell house. And so Eleanor's father, this was his childhood home and we can go back to a photo now of Eleanor's father. Okay. Okay, so this, this is Lawrence Powell. This is Eleanor's father and he was born and raised in Milton. He was a star athlete um, enlisted in the army. Obviously this is World War I uniform. And he trained at a camp, uh, Camp Zachary. And that's a, it was a segregated base in Kentucky. And that's where he met um, Eleanor's mother, a woman named Gladys Farrow. And she was a college educated school teacher. They fell in love, um, married, and moved back to Milton 
where um, Lawrence Powell, his father, clearly uh, was in a better position. It was the North, and they knew that they had a better chance of success because Kentucky was steeped in Jim Crow in that during that time. This is the early 1900s. So Eleanor's life was solidly middle class. And here's a childhood photo of Eleanor. I mean, she grew up in the Depression, but her father, Lawrence, had trained um, and apprenticed in elevator repairs. So he became a clerk. He became an elevator operator at the Boston Customs Building. And some family lore has said that he actually worked an apprentice as an elevator engineer and moved up and became in, was in that position. But he eventually um, moved out of his family home and bought himself his own Dutch colonial. So Eleanor, um, this was the second part of her um, childhood. So she grew up clearly in very stable, idyllic conditions. And she was quite popular in school. And even though this is, they're one of the first African-American families in Milton, um, they're warmly accepted. Her mother actually um, was high up in Girl Scouts and was celebrated for integrating the first overnight uh, trip for, for African-Americans to participate in. And Eleanor was active in extracurriculars and uh, she, she was quite, uh, quite spunky. And she wanted to actually, she had dreams of being, um, we, can, we can go out of this photo actually. She had dreams of being a, a physician, um, a, a veterinary, excuse me. And her mother said, well, you know what? No, not actually, not that I don't know too many black women who are veterinarians unless, and her mother said, unless you wanna be in the stockyards with farm animals, you, you're not, you're not gonna ever be a veterinarian. And that was always a source of tension. Um, between Eleanor and her mother because she was shutting down her dream. So Eleanor, she said, well, you know what? I'm going to be a nurse. So that's what happened. So Eleanor, who um, uh, she was born in 1921. So now we are in 19, I believe it's 1940 or 41. She goes to the Lincoln School of Nurses in the Bronx. Um, and I have, I do have a photo of that as well. Oh, this is Eleanor and her parents. Of course, this is when she's about to go to nursing school. And here is Eleanor as a student. Um, so the Lincoln School of Nurses, this was one of the many schools um, that started popping up in the late 1800s, early 1900s, schools for African-Americans. Usually they were founded by white philanthropists. Um, so Eleanor, she was a strong student. She graduated um, top 10. She's living in Harlem. Um, she's making a decision in her life. Unfortunately, her father died in 1943, the year of her graduation of uh, complications to hypertension. And you know, this is during an era where just didn't have the medications to control it. So she had a significant loss and she needed to, to decide what direction she was going in. And did she want to be a, work in a city hospital? And during that time, there were significant pay disparities um, between white and, and black nurses. And she decided, nope, she's gonna follow in her father's footsteps and she is going to enlist in the Army Nurse Corps. So that's what she does. Not to mention, there's all this talk of a nursing shortage. You know, she wants to be a part of the war effort. And, and, and when we're talking 1943, 1944, you'd be hard pressed to have a family that in some way, someone wasn't serving in some capacity. So in 1944, she heads to Fort Huachuca um, in Arizona. And this is Eleanor now um, in the Army Nurse Corps. Now, Fort Huachuca in, is in Arizona, close to the border, the Mexican border. And it becomes, I think I have another photo of her. It becomes uh, the largest military installation um, for African Americans during World War II. It's actually home to the 92nd and 93rd divisions, and those were the large black divisions of soldiers, the enlisted men and the officers. They, at one point, were all at Fort Huachuca. And this base was largely black enlisted men and then white commanding officers. And so there's a history of, of, of racial tensions um, between the black soldiers and the white commanding officers who frankly just weren't thrilled 
that they were commanding uh, units of black men. They considered that beneath them. So there was a lot of tension um, at Fort Huachuca. And we can, I can go back to now, just me. <laughs> um, so here we are, Eleanor now is in Arizona. And Arizona is very different from Massachusetts. And Arizona, um, even though a lot of the Deep South uh, is, is gets a reputation that it was just all Jim Crow, but it really was all across the United States and as well, and Arizona included. So there were whites only signs. Um, it was completely segregated and it really did shock Eleanor. And even though clearly she was in Boston and in New York, she would have encountered that. Her mother was from Kentucky. But because Milton was progressive, she was largely shielded. So, you know, you could be aware of it, but it didn't impact her during her childhood. Um, and in New York, you would still have the segregated areas too, but because she had her school, her nursing friends, and it's a bustling city, she didn't have to cope with the isolation. She still had options. But when she got into the military and she gets to Fort Huachuca and everything is separated, even the hospital, like just, just a hospital for blacks, hospital for whites, barracks for blacks, barracks for whites, she's shocked. And particularly because her whole intention is I'm patriotic, I'm serving my country. Why am I now being treated like this? So that, that impacted her. Now, the military clearly is it's going to adhere to the laws of the time. So it was segregated just like society was. Um, and civil rights leaders push back on this, organizations push back on this. Um, even before um, Pearl Harbor, um, there were a lot of war preparedness programs going on and um, blacks wanted to be involved. They wanted to enlist and particularly black nurses who were RNs and they wanted to be in the Army Nurse Corps and they weren't accepted. So a woman named Mabel Stoppers um, and she becomes a significant force and advocate for black nurses. She leads an organization called uh, the National Association of Colored Graduate Nurses. And so she's advocating, she's pushing, she's going to FDR, she's going to um, um, Eleanor Roosevelt, look, we've got all these talented, qualified black nurses, they wanna join the army. And so there's a lot of back and forth and the Surgeon General of the Army at the time, a man named General James McGee was not um, on board at all. But finally, finally he said, okay, they can, they can enter. Black women can be part of the Army Nurse Corps, but there's gonna be a quota. And so the incoming, the first group, some numbers say 48 or some say 50, but in 1942, about 50 black women uh, entered in the Army Nurse Corps, okay? So 1943, you had 160. By the time Eleanor entered in 1944, you were still only around 330 black nurses. Meanwhile, at least 9,000, 9,000 black nurses uh, tried to uh, enlist, but were denied. And so there was this growing, there's just outrage, like, wait a minute, you're talking about a nursing shortage. We, we'd like to be a part of this. And it was just really this sad state of affairs that they were rejected because of the color of their skin. Um, meanwhile, if you want to even the ratio to really crystallize it, you have 330 black nurses in the Army Nurse Corps compared to approximately 40,000 white nurses and a growing need for even more nurses. And the African-American nurses saying, hey, me, me, I want to be a part of this. And every excuse, well, we only keep black nurses, the ratio in proportion to the number of black soldiers, which wasn't true because it still was too low. And frankly, it just was discrimination. Um, so anyway, we have the 330 black nurses who are in, and that number will steadily rise to almost 500 by the end of the war. But when Eleanor comes around in 1944, we're around 330. So she's trying to make the best of it. Now, most of the nurses, um, a great deal of them are from the South. That's where a lot of the historically black colleges and universities are located that have nursing schools. So they're more accustomed to Jim Crow. It's not throwing them in, in, in the way that it's, it's getting under Eleanor's skin. Um, 
they're they're more used to it. But the good news is there still is some social life. So you've got the black soldiers there. You've got uh, the wax, the part of the women's army corps, and they were part of the service command. So they could be mechanics. They could put on dances for soldiers, anything to help and keep up morale. Um, and eventually Fort Huachuca built an officer's club because for years, the officer's club, there was just one, it was called Lakeside and only white officers were allowed. And after a lot of um, complaints, black officers, like we need a recreational place too, uh, Mountain View Officers Club for Blacks. Um, was built at Fort Huachuca. So now they had a destination. Now they had big bands playing. Um, even though it was segregated, they did have now finally a destination. So Eleanor, in the meantime, she's going into the city on her day off and she can't get served at the lunch counter. Um, she There's several uh, places that just won't even uh, patronize any um, Blacks in uniform. And this, this just really gets to her. And there are some, even some encounters that are really, really nasty where locals are, are, are calling some of the uh, enlisted men and some of the nurses, the N word. And when you think about her background that I've shared with you, she grew up in all white neighborhood. She went to white schools. Those were her friends. Like, so she didn't have these uh, negative experiences. So it really hit her hard. And when you're researching a book, you get so connected with the people you're writing about. And I really did connect with Eleanor on this, on this particular subject matter. Now I'm not, I've never served in the military, but I, I can tell you a little about my background, why I connected with her when she felt so much pain when she encountered discrimination. So um, I grew up in Dallas, Texas. And I went to wonderful elite private schools, um, very few blacks at the time when I was there. Um, I was the only one in my grade. It was a preschool through fourth grade uh, school. The other, other two blacks there were my two brothers. And I remember <laughs> I was in the third grade and I was in art class. And I don't know what the argument was about. I can't remember that part. But I remember I was arguing with a, a boy, his name was Mahmoud. And we were going about whatever it was. And at some point, I don't know what happened, but he said, you stupid N-word. And the table got quiet. The teacher was nowhere to be found. But I just remember I had pigtails and I had ribbons. That's where my mom used to do my hair. And I remember I was hanging down and I was panicked. I'm like, I, I, I got to do something. I got to say something. But I didn't know what to do. I was so thrown. And I came out with something I said, you know, you, you, you go back in, in your canoe. And you go away, something like that, literally about that. I just remember canoe. It was my attempt to slur him back. So I remember that same day uh, when I got home from school, um, my parents asked me how my day was, and I started crying. Um, I was hurt. I was embarrassed. I was wounded. I didn't feel any better that I had tried to slur him. And anyway, and the sad part is, I didn't even know what I was talking about because I guess I thought I was slurring a Native American. He wasn't, but my DNA says that some of my DNA is Native American. So I was actually insulting my own family line. But the point is, it hurt me insulting him. That's when I knew I, that's just not in me. I'm not going to do, I can't do that. So if I encounter that, I'm going to have to figure out a way to maintain my dignity and my decency, not stoop to that and, and walk away with dignity or defend myself with dignity. And I realized that is really what Eleanor and these fellow nurses had to do because there was going to be no satisfaction slurring someone back. And also it, who knows what the backlash would have been during that time when Jim Crow was the lay of the land. But it made me connect with her because you know that shock and you're like, why, why is this happening? Um, but you suck it up and you move on. And that's what Eleanor did. That's what she. That's what she tried to do. So, anyway, Eleanor finishes her basic training, um, and this is when they learn that they're going to get their official orders. You know, are they going to go help frontline soldiers? Are they going to go overseas? What, what's going to happen? 
So Eleanor and her group, they hear that they are going to a POW camp in, in uh, Arizona, in a more isolated place, Florence, Arizona, to take care of German POWs. And they're like, what? POWs? Why? 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 Wait a minute. We didn't train for that. Why, why are we doing this? And so um, through my archival research, uh, apparently Eleanor's commanding officer shared with them that they were replacing a unit of white nurses who the military uh, felt had become too uh, familiar and was too much fraternization going on with the German POWs. And so they said, you know what, let's, let's move them out. Let's bring these black nurses in. Um, there won't be any problems. So, I mean, clearly that's insulting for so many <laughs> reasons, but that is how Eleanor came to uh, Camp Florence. So the fact is the military did really not, they didn't really want white nurses at POW camps. They really did prefer that they were treating the soldiers on the front lines. Um, that was, that's where the need was. Um, and also they considered POWs uh, a second class assignment that was suitable for black nurses. So black nurses in World War II ended up either in segregated bases where there were black soldiers or at POW camps um, for most of the war until the final few months. And, um, you know, and it goes without saying, given the numbers of white nurses, they absolutely had to take care of POWs as well. That, that just, that was a fact since there were so few black nurses. However, whenever the swap could be made, it was made. Um, so anyway, that's where they are. They're like, what are we gonna do? I don't, there's a lot of fear actually. I came across some old letters from nurses. They were writing to the NAACP. They were writing to their families. They were really nervous. They, they didn't wanna interact with uh, German soldiers. I mean, they were, they were afraid. Um, and these were also people who had killed Americans. So they have to take their orders and they go to Camp Florence and the situation is bleak. It really is. Um, there's still tensions in the local area. Uh, the black nurses uh, aren't really welcomed and uh, they do have some fine respect and relationship, like friendly with the German POWs, but there were incidents where it wasn't, it wasn't nice at all. Um, I came across this one story of this nurse and this German POW uh, called her the N-word and she reported him to the commanding officer and the commanding officer asked the POW, why did you call her that? And the POW apparently explained his reasons why and why he thought she was and the commanding officer did nothing. And so those type of things, those many of those things are when the nurses weren't invited places um, when white fellow physicians or guards would say hello to the German POWs, but not the black nurses, that stuff really started to impact the morale of black nurses. Um, and it also, it, it, it hurt them because people in a position of authority, their commanding officers, they thought would have their backs. And in some cases they did, but in Eleanor's case, they really didn't. And my heart ached for them. And again, I, I, I thought about a situation I encountered and um, it's really a lesson of when someone in a position of authority uh, lets you down or you, you think they're gonna have your back. And it brought me to uh, another school situation. Now all these, these are isolated. I had a wonderful childhood, but that's because when you have these moments, you just, they hit hard. And I'll never forget uh, I was in fifth grade and now we're in a different private school. And uh, I was in math class and we had a math teacher where we would do these drills and two students would compete. They would do an equation and whoever finished first, they would get a prize. And the prize was always like some, really some boob prize. Like for, for example, the winner of this prize gets a trip to the Trinity River. Now the Trinity River is one of the most, at the time, polluted, disgusting rivers in Dallas. So, you know, it was all a joke. 
and they're like, who goes to Trinity River? You get that trip. And the class goes, ew, that was just part of the game. So one day, it's time for our drill. And the teacher says, you get a trip to Oak Cliff. Now, Oak Cliff's where I live. And Oak Cliff is a predominantly black neighborhood. And the history of it is, I mean, I live near a park, I live near a country club, um, pretty homes. It used to be an all white neighborhood. And then there was the history, it's kind of pretty common, black middle class moved in, there was white flight, and then it eventually becomes more black. And I didn't understand that. So when he said, you get a trip to a cliff, and they go, ooh, I thought, wait a minute. I was going on play dates by then. My house just looks like my friend's house. The only difference is my neighbors are black. And when that teacher did that, I thought, wow. You know, it was it was the first encounter where I had a teacher, someone in a position of authority, where I thought, they're not really on my side. Like, this hurts. And I think the nurses felt that way, that they didn't have um, anyone to turn to. And I think that's how some of the nurses felt. And Eleanor really felt isolated. And she was starting to become bitter about her experience. She trained. She wanted to help soldiers. She wouldn't be insulted. She wouldn't be isolated um, in this POW camp. And most of the POWs were fine. I mean, they really didn't have a lot of health uh, conditions to make that transatlantic journey. They had to be healthy. Um, so... There were very few critical cases. So the black nurses are starting to get really impatient. And so her experience, though, changes uh, one day when she meets Frederick. And I thought this is very quick, a passage that I read you the day she meets him at Camp Florence. A profound feeling overcame Frederick when he spotted a beautiful, tall, black woman. He had never felt so drawn to a complete stranger before. It was as if he had been hypnotized when he first made eye contact with Eleanor. She walked in with the other nurses and headed to their designated eating area, which was removed from the tables where white officers and physicians sat. Frederick didn't see anyone else in the room. She was striking at six feet tall, and her impeccable posture gave her a regal quality. Her mother had always told her daughters to stand up straight the way dignified and important women did. Incapable of concentrating on his kitchen duties, Frederick bypassed the POW waiters and walked right up to Eleanor. He looked her in the eyes, smiled, and said with a German accent, you should know my name. I'm the man who's going to marry you. So <laughs> that's quite an introduction, right? What kind of guy does that? So now my, you know, I know a lot about Eleanor. I've got to know about Frederick. And I have some photos of Frederick that I, I want to zoom in on. So this is Frederick. This is the man who um, sees Eleanor, proposes. And I needed to know about him. And surprising, his sons didn't know, couldn't answer a lot of the questions. I mean, he was a very private person. And, and that was a generation that I don't know. They didn't share as much as they do now. And so fortunately, I was able to uh, meet Frederick's older sister who was still alive. She passed away two years ago. But I would go back and forth to Munich to interview her. And she was alert. I mean, she was just on it. You know, she was a freedom just to say what she wanted. She was in her 90s. I think she's like, whatever. And her daughter was there, um, Christina, and she would translate for me. And then I had a translator back here translate that interview just in case uh, Christina missed some words. So when he, I got to hear about their childhood. And so this is Frederick's father. He was from a wealthy family. So Frederick was born in Alpen, Germany, which is now part of Poland. But he grew up, basically they moved to Vienna. And his father, this man here, Carl Albert, was a successful engineer. Uh, he made uh, fireproofing materials, cement, refractory bricks, and he would contract with uh, the German army. And his mother, a woman here, her name was Margaret, 
Uh, she was very social, uh, popular, and they were kind of this it couple. Um, and they were not members of the Nazi party, um, but they were German nationalists. Um, they believed in the German empire and superiority. And so it was just Frederick and his sister. And I asked her to describe what it was like growing up. And um, her father, she said, was very cold and uninterested in them. Um, and he openly carried on affairs. And they always lived very nicely and beautifully. And as you can see, this is part of their garden. And um, I think there's another one closer up. And so anyway, Frederick also, um, I'm sorry, here's another one. If you could share that, great. So here we are. So Frederick was nothing like his father either. So his father is, you know, he said, he was in the first war, uh, he was in the reserves for World War II. He's a successful businessman. Um, and Frederick's the complete opposite. Um, I, we can narrow that down now. Um, Frederick's a painter. He's into jazz, even after Hitler banned jazz. Uh, at some point before it became too dangerous, uh, Frederick was still sneaking, listening to his albums. He had a very romantic view. Um, he was against the war, um, and no interest in it, didn't believe in it. And I remember I was asking her, I said, didn't you all talk about the brutality, what was going on? And she said, well, there's one thing I remember. And she said it was one, uh, they were having breakfast and her father, Carl whispered to her that one of her, saw one of her classmates on a train platform with another group of people and her classmate was Jewish. And I said, they were being taken away, rounded up. And she said, yes. I said, you didn't ask what happened? What happened? What happened to her? She said, no. I said, you didn't ask anything? What was, she said, you wouldn't dare. And for me, you know, it's just like, oh my gosh, I, I, I want to know where, where, where they stand on this. And the way she described it is that, where for one, they didn't have really a relationship with their parents, but you never questioned your parents. And there was just enough programming going on in that household and in society that you knew not to say a word. You just didn't question it out of fear. So those are one of those answers that, you know, here I'm of my generation. It just doesn't feel satisfying, but that's what she told me. So they grew up in this house of a lot of silence um, and estrangement. So eventually Frederick is drafted. And... Um, Although he tells his sons later on, they thought that he was a paratrooper. And unfortunately, I got hold of all his papers and I had to break the news that no, he was a low ranked medic. Um, but he did get um, captured in Italy and then he was sent to um, Camp Florence. And that's how he um, that's how he met Eleanor. So then the um, love story begins. And I think I have some more photos of them from the POW days. This is when him and his gear. But this is when he saw Eleanor in her nurse's whites. And as you can see, she's very tall. Very, she is regal looking. Um, and this is Frederick. So he gets an assignment. He's in the mess hall. He is uh, cooking in the kitchen. And this is another photo of him at the camp. So they, are, they have a, a, their love story begins. So it starts as a flirtation though. We can turn this off. They start flirting. So for example, um, if there's meatloaf one light, he might make her her own uh, Wiener schnitzel, right? If there's serving jello, for a dessert or cookies and he'd make her like apple strudel. He, he started doing things like that. And eventually um, they just fall in love. And I think their romance was symbolic um, for so many reasons. Um, I think they were both escaping their realities. Um, Frederick was against the war. He was estranged from his father, um, didn't want to fight Eleanor. She was against Jim Crow, the discrimination. Um, she wanted to be treated as an equal. And they both shunned um, each country's racialized laws because whether they were in Germany or where they were in a Jim Crow state, being together was against the law. 
it was just a double, it was also a double taboo because she's in the uh, US Army and he's a POW. But young and in love, they did it anyway. So um, I asked him like, how did this happen? And Charlotte shared with me um, that Eleanor and Frederick would find abandoned rooms in a hospital. Um, she shared that uh, in a surgery room, I shot a surgery uh, bed, that's where they would make love. And I'm like, wow, he shared that? She said, yes. And he was proud of it. <laughs> so anyway, they would have these rendezvous in the hospital. And so the war then ends. And these two are just, no, we don't, we don't, we don't want to leave each other. No, we want to spend the rest of our lives together. And by law, all the German POWs would have to leave the United States. Many came back. But POWs leave. You just can't keep them. Um, and some went to um, some went to back directly to Germany, and then others um, had to stay and help rebuild England and France for a bit. So they decided, okay, what are we going to do before you leave? So they thought about the one thing that would keep them uh, together forever. So given what we know, what they did in the hospital, let's just say nine months later. They come up with something. Now he's gone and she's returning home to uh, as an unwed <laughs> mother uh, and the father is a German POW. So her mother was not happy. Needless to say, he makes it. He does return. They prove sponsorship. Her, her sisters, her friends, they sponsor. Look, we can take care of him financially till he gets a job. We can do this. And he's able to return. So Frederick returns to United States in June 1947, and they marry within a couple of days. They go to the courthouse in uh, Manhattan in New York because blacks and whites could marry then. It was not against the law. And it's funny, they married almost to the day, 20 years before the landmark Loving v. Virginia decision. And that's when the Supreme Court in 1967 said, look, all you states that have these bans on interracial marriage is unconstitutional. So they were 20 years before that. So now they begin their journey, and I have a photo of them as a couple. Uh, they begin their journey as a mixed race couple. Um, they're in Boston and they struggle. Uh, no one wants to rent to them. He can't keep a job. There's a, uh, they don't wanna hire him. They have issues with them being mixed race. And so Eleanor decides, you know what? I don't want you to regret this. Um, let's let's go to germany you're you're supposed to take over your father's corporation and he's like well i don't know i don't i don't think you understand germany she's like no we can do this let's just try it so they go to germany with their son and at this point their son is about five years old and this is circa 1952. and they go to germany and um you can move this back it's not it, it it's it's not what Eleanor had hoped to be. Uh, Frederick's mother is not happy with his choice. Um, she even, Christina has shared with me that her grandmother would say in German, like, why didn't he marry someone white? Um, she doted on Stephen though, but Eleanor, she really had issues with. So Eleanor was very unhappy, isolated. Frederick was not doing well at his father's corporation. Their old tensions rose up again. So then they decided to move back. So they go back to the United States and not much has changed, unfortunately. Now they have another boy. So he's moving jobs and gets the idea, I'm going to go to baking school, which was smart. So he gets certified or what degree he gets and he becomes uh, an employee of Pepperidge Farm and moves up the ladder. And they eventually move to Connecticut and stumble across this community called Village Creek. And it's founded by World War II veterans as a prejudice-free zone. It's in their covenants. And that's where Eleanor and um, uh, Frederick, here's a photo of them now with their two sons. This is where they spend the rest of their lives. So this is a split lever home. It's in South Norwalk, Connecticut. This is their family homes. And they stay there until their death. So they're married for more than 50 years. And it took moving from Boston, um, moving 
to Europe and, and several places in Boston and then going to Europe and then coming back and moving around Philly and all these little Northeastern places until he finally finds stability as um, an executive. He makes up to vice president at Pepperidge Farm. And this is where they spend uh, the rest of their lives. Um, I love this photo of them. It wasn't easy, uh, but they made it. And you can, you can uh, take down the photos. And it's a story where racism didn't win. Um, and it's a beautiful love story, but it's also filled with all the hardships that happens. Uh, so that's, that's, that's a wrap up for me. And thank you. I'd love to hear some questions. Wonderful. Alexis, that was so well done. And we've had some fabulous comments about what a beautiful story uh, it is. And, and so many people thankful for you um, highlighting the story. And, and actually, as, as we have any questions come in, and I encourage everyone to uh, read the book. If you have not, uh, we actually sell it in our gift store. Um, and I, I, you can find it on amazon.com uh, as well. But it's so great. And you know, I was curious, Alexis, in the story with everything that they went through and uh, both in Germany and here um, in America, why do you think they were reluctant, Frederick and Eleanor, to talk, have an open dialogue with their sons about race and what it was to be black in America? They didn't really yeah. talk to them very much. Is that correct? That's yeah. true. They didn't talk to them about it. And I think they did it to protect them. I don't think it was the, the the right decision, but that's what they thought at the time. They thought that rehashing, and this is what relatives have told me, rehashing their pain and getting it into their children's mind that people are going to think less of you because of your skin color. We don't want to set them up for that. But the problem is the sons would encounter that anyway. So they weren't prepared and they felt that their parents had been naive about that. And so, um, talking to them, you know, I know they wish they had had more um, frank conversations with their parents. And it's also a generational thing. I don't think then they shared pa pain the way we do now with our parents. I just think you, 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 leave it, you leave it behind and you keep moving forward. Mm -hmm. That's so true. And I love uh, someone just commented that uh, Jim Belcher, one of our viewers, who said his parents, too, were enemies in love. His mother, Japanese, and his dad, U.S. Uh, Navy from Alabama, and they mm -hmm. fell in love, just showing that it illustrates the unlikely but realistic examples of enemies bridging the hate and demonization realities. And so mm -hmm. how true uh, stories of this tolerance, forgiveness, and unconditional love. And they certainly have that. And as you said, it was, there were so many um, hurdles and obstacles that they faced throughout their lives, but they, uh, their, their love was always there through all yes. of that. And it's, that, that is so interesting yes. um, to see that. Um, just as one other question um, I had, do you think for Eleanor and, and Frederick too, it had to be, um, and I think you touch on this in the book, World War II in many ways, a turning point in terms of looking at just the discrimination that um, black men and women who served in the military felt uh, when they looked at how German POWs were treated, you know, that they could socialize with the guards, that they could use the same restrooms. And, and, and then here are these um, black men and women who are giving everything to serve their country who are being treated so much worse. I, I mean, do you think, um, did, did Eleanor and Frederick see that as a turning point for race relations in the country? Or how did you think they viewed World War II in general? Well, I think with those race relations. With the I think uh, Frederick, you know, being the first time he, um, when he was a POW in the United States, I think he was shocked. He wasn't really aware of Jim Crow. You know, a lot of the letters that I read of some of the POWs, they were shocked and they thought, well, wait a minute you all really don't have the moral authority on this. Look how you're treating blacks, you know? So I think uh, he was very shocked by it. Um, but again, they just didn't really share um, exactly uh, their concluding opinion about it. I do know that Eleanor said she wasn't shocked by segregation, but it was always so maddening. It, it, her whole military experience was very maddening because she, the whole separate, it, it was never separate and equal. 
that this is not the way it happened. They always felt like second class citizens. Yeah. Yes. Well, it's beautifully told. Again, I just uh, cannot recommend the book enough. You learned a lot about, um, I, I, well, I, and I guess I'll ask you this, Alexa, what was in your research, what was the most surprising um, research that you uncovered in this entire story? What was most shocking wow. to you? Well, that's hard. I think it's one story that just one anecdote that comes to mind and it's just kind of, it's just hitching the gut. And it was, um, I think it was in El Paso around 1943 and these black soldiers were at a train depot and they wanted to eat, but they weren't allowed in the dining hall because it was segregated and they peek through the window and they see some POWs and guards getting served and that they just would like POWs really. And I, when I read that story, and apparently that was that made a lot of headlines back then. There was outrage everywhere, but I really couldn't believe that. I couldn't believe that yeah. those soldiers couldn't eat, and then when they saw who could, I mean that that was really yeah. something. Well, and I think when I was reading the thing, uh, the one item that stood out, and I had I had read this, but it just really highlighted it in your story and your in your research was that just the fact that there was such a shortage of nurses in the country at this time, and yet you had thousands of uh, young black women who were ready to serve and were turned down, and uh, so again, just really shocking uh, to read to read and know that 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 happened. So thank you for highlighting. This and this, um, and also just the beautiful love story between Eleanor and Frederick as well. To know that they their love uh, overcame any obstacles uh, that they encountered is really quite beautiful. So, um, and I think everybody agrees. We've had a lot of very positive comments from all of our viewers um, for bringing this story to us. So we enjoy. Uh, we're going to enjoy whatever new project you have. We're going to look forward to um, having you back. I hope in the near future to uh, talk to us some more. So, I love that. I just want to thank um, everyone for joining us today. This has been a wonderful presentation. And Alexis, thank you again for being with us. Um, and hope uh, everyone will tune in uh, to us again soon. And we definitely will have Alexis back uh, in the near future. So thank you so much. Thank you. It's my I don't pleasure. think you have any other questions. <laughs> thank you, Alexis. And everyone stay safe out there. And we'll talk to you soon. Okay. Bye. Bye. -bye.